may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ said. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Almighty God, who alone canst order the unruly wills and affections of sinful men, grant unto thy people that they may love the thing which thou commandest and desire which thou dost promise, that so among the sundry and manifold changes of the world our hearts may surely there be fixed, where true joys are to be found, through thy Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Thank you. 
Gospel according to St. John, beginning at the fifth verse. Jesus said unto his disciples, Now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you asketh me, Whither goest thou? But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and ye see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. I believe in one God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one Catholic and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Hallelujah, the Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Good morning and welcome this fourth Sunday after Easter. Good morning also to our online viewers. Uh, today uh, we have even song at 5.30 for Eastertide. The music begins at 5.05. There will be a reception in the Green Melbourne House afterwards. A special thank you being made to all those who contributed to the uh, fire room renovation project. Uh, and that's uh, also um, uh, Parents' Night Out, uh, youth uh, <coughs> group is meeting tonight, and so for uh, parents and young children, please, uh, and youth, rather, notify uh, us as soon as possible, uh, and uh, you'll be free to attend Evensong, if you wish. Next Sunday uh, is the, um, actually the fifth Sunday after Easter, but in the world's calendar, it is Mother's Day, and uh, we have a uh, accomplished photographer lined up to take family photos uh, after the 9 o'clock service and after the 11 o'clock service in the mall. Uh, and uh, we're going to arrange, if we can, for attractive weather for that occasion. 
So uh, these photos will be available uh, as a gift. So feel free uh, to come uh, and make plans to have your photo taken next week. Please stand for the invitation. At the Last Supper, Jesus said unto his disciples, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So immense, so amazing are the implications of Jesus going from the world to the Father by the cross, uh, by the resurrection, by the ascension, that we take multiple weeks of the church's year just to get our, hand, our minds around them. And fortunately, we have the very words that Jesus himself used to explain these things to his own disciples at the Last Supper on the night before he died. And so our, our gospel lesson today, as in a number of other Sundays, comes from those chapters of St. John, uh, chapters 14, 15, and 16, where he, as it were, spills the beans. Now, the disciples, as you can imagine, were enormously upset to learn that Jesus was about to leave them. Leave them. Uh, of course, they were only, it was only going to get worse. Their pain and sorrow would get all the worse because, of course, they, at this point, didn't realize that it would involve the very traumatic uh, shame and pain of the cross. Uh, but they're already very upset, uh, and you can understand why. They committed their lives to Jesus. They set their hopes on him as the Messiah, and here he was apparently on the verge of doing something significant, uh, leaving them, leaving them in the lurch, leaving his mission up in the air, leaving them hanging, uh, wondering just how this is supposed to further uh, the hopes uh, or fulfill the hopes that they had set in Jesus. Um, but Jesus says to them, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you. It's to your advantage that I go away. Paradoxical as that may seem, it is to your advantage I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter, uh, the word is paraclete, but it's translated here in this version as comforter. The paraclete or comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. In this it's a bit of a paradox, isn't it? The way Jesus accomplishes the mission for which he was sent into the world by the Father is for him to leave the world and go to the Father. That indeed is a paradox, but of course it is this, it is true. It is by his atoning death for sin that he delivers his, uh, the, the world from wrath to favor with God. Um, but here he's saying not only are they going to receive the forgiveness of sins, you might say the negative aspect of the blessings he's going to bring, but also the positive side, they're going to receive the gift of the Spirit, the promised presence of God with his covenant people in power. And uh, so that's objectively, that's going to be the consequences of his going to the Father. He's going to unlock those gifts for his church uh, by his going to the Father. At the same time, the aching sense of absence that they're left with means that there is, as it were, a Christ-shaped hole in their souls for the comforter to fill. Uh, and so both those objective and subjective sides mean that it is indeed expedient for them that he go away. Only by going from the world to the Father will he complete the work he was sent to accomplish, not only our deliverance from sin, but also the gift of the Spirit, the promised presence and power of God with his people, his covenant people. I've used the word spirit and comforter interchangeably, so let's think about that for a minute. When we speak about the spirit, we primarily mean the spirit of prophecy, the spirit that empowers human beings to speak the word of God. 
to speak God's own words uh, and, and, and also to um, uh, proclaim God's words in words, but also, of course, by actions of power. Um, but Jesus, so that's uh, in view here. He's, what Jesus is saying is the spirit of prophecy is going to come upon you. You're going to be empowered to speak words of power. Uh, you're going to be empowered to speak God's words. And, uh, but Jesus calls the spirit the paraclete. And as I said, in our version, it's translated as comforter, which is a good translation because, indeed, the paraclete does bring uh, the believers the comfort, the strength and encouragement and confidence of the gospel. Uh, so his, that holy comfort is indeed a major aspect of what he comes to bring. But that word paraclete can also be translated advocate, which means someone who is, speaks on your behalf, someone who makes the case for you, perhaps before a judge. Uh, in the comfortable words, uh, we hear that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Well, and that's the same word, paraclete. Jesus is the advocate. He's the one who speaks for us, intervenes for us, intercedes for us, and he does speak with God, and he does so uh, by his own precious blood. Um, so uh, that's one sense, the word advocate. Well, the Spirit is also going to be an advocate. But he's not our advocate with the Father. Jesus is our advocate with the Father, and his intercession on our behalf is more than adequate. We don't need other intercessors, other advocates, other mediators. We have one mediator, an advocate, and he is enough. No, the Spirit is the advocate for Jesus to the world and to the disciples. So if the disciples need Jesus to advocate for them to the Father, Jesus needs someone to advocate for him to the world and to his disciples. Someone to be, as it were, a mediator between Jesus and his church, Jesus and the world. And so we put those things together and we say, ah, so in and through the uh, inspired, empowered, spirit-empowered witness and preaching of the gospel by the disciples, the spirit himself will be acting and speaking. And the spirit will be acting as the advocate of Jesus. And in particular, in relation to the world, the Spirit is going to be a kind of prosecuting attorney. Jesus says, when he has come, he will reprove the world. He'll convict the world. He'll prove the world wrong. And prove it wrong about Christ. And he says, in particular, the Spirit will convict the world of sin... Because they believe not on me, of righteousness, because I go to the Father and ye see me no more, and of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. So that's very compressed. Let me unpack that a bit. We've got three things he's going to convict the world of, prove it wrong about in relation to Jesus, sin, righteousness, and judgment. Now, sin... The world knows, everyone knows, sin is the breaking of God's law. But what the unbelieving world doesn't know, that all such sins are forgiven through faith in Christ. And so what Jesus is saying, I'm gonna, they're gonna, the Spirit's going to convict the world of sin because they believe not in me, he's pointing out that the heart of sin is not breaking the commandments, but the refusal to believe in Christ by whom that law-breaking may be forgiven. The world's deepest misery, the place in which it is most lost, doesn't consist in moral imperfection, but in its alienation from God, its estrangement from God, and its refusal to allow itself to be called out of that alienation, that estrangement, by the one that God has sent into the world for that very purpose. That's what the Spirit's preaching through the disciples is going to accomplish. He's going to convict the world of its sin. 
He's going to convict the world of refusing to receive and believe in the one through whom all sins may be forgiven and all enmity and estrangement and alienation from God overcome. So that's the first thing. The second thing, you might say the first thing is the Spirit's going to convict the world of what it does wrong. But the second thing is the Spirit's going to convict the world of what it does right. The Spirit is going to convict the world of righteousness. And you think, how can I be convicted as wrong for doing something right? Well, just remember what Jesus said to the scribes and Pharisees. Ye are like whited sepulchers. Tombs that are painted a bright, shining white, all pure and clean on the outside. Ye are like unto whited sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful, beautiful outward, but are within full of dead man's bones and of all uncleanness. Outside it looks very beautiful. Inside it is full of rot and corruption. It's nasty. It's defiling. Yuck. That's what he's saying the world's righteousness is like. What he means by that is to say, yes, we can jump through certain hoops, which we identify as following the rules God has made, but what's the reason, the inward motivation for our obedience? Basically, it's either pride or fear. Arrogance, pride, wanting to boast about our own righteousness, or fear, fear of the consequences of not following God's laws. Well, that means there's no wholehearted fulfillment of God's law here. The righteousness is purely external. It's not inward. It's not from the heart. It is, in fact, a false righteousness, and the Spirit is going to convict the world of its righteousness. The only real righteousness, the only true righteousness, the only true and right relation of human beings to God is revealed in the one human being who did not obey God out of fear or pride, but out of love. And that is Jesus, who willingly fulfilled God's will in its entirety on the cross in his going to the Father for us and our behalf. As St. John says, words we all know, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. And only by his righteousness can we attain righteousness. And because, as Jesus adds here, ye see me no more, his righteousness can be ours only by faith. So the Spirit is going to convict the world of sin because it doesn't believe in Jesus. It's going to convict the world of its righteousness as a false righteousness. And it's also going to convict the world of its judgment. And the judgment here is the judgment it passed on Jesus when it rejected him and condemned him and put him under the curse of God as a blasphemer, as the enemy of God and men. And when the world passed that judgment on Jesus, against Jesus, it passed a judgment on the one that God vindicated by raising him from the dead which meant that the judgment that the world had passed on Christ now comes back on itself. The world is condemned in its condemnation of Christ. The world is judged in its judgment of Christ. And not just the world, but on the prince of this world, on Satan, the devil, whose lies and deceits the world had bought into and by which it is held in bondage to darkness and ignorance. So this all sounds, there's a, another paradox here. This is, the passage is full of them. Here it is, the Spirit is doing this work as a prosecuting attorney. He's going to convict the world and show that it's wrong about sin, about its righteousness, about its judgment. But the outcome, of course, is anything but judgment. The outcome is anything but condemnation. It's actually the reverse. You know, the moment you see you've been deceived by the lies 
and deceits of Satan, that's the moment when Satan has lost his power over you. That's the moment when you are set free. The moment when you realize that your righteousness is just a whited sepulcher full of corruption and rot is the moment you say, well, I can't put my trust in my own righteousness. Whose righteousness will I put my trust in? And the moment you, you, you're convicted of sin because you don't believe in Jesus, well, that's the moment where the lights have finally come on. Those are the moments where salvation breaks through. The Spirit is going to act as a prosecuting attorney on the world, unbelieving world, not to condemn the world, but to save the world. So the Spirit, you might say, is going to condemn us, is going to convict us precisely in order that it may comfort us and comfort us as we can be comforted only by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. But until the world is delivered from blindness and ignorance, that cannot happen. Only when the Spirit has done its convicting work can we be delivered from blindness and ignorance and turn to the Lord in repentance and faith and find in Him a salvation that covers all our sins and brings us all the way to God. If you know our liturgy, you'll recognize that our liturgy is designed as an instrument for the Spirit to accomplish precisely this work. Because our liturgy alerts us to our sin. Our liturgy alerts us to our guilt. Our liturgy alerts us to our need for a righteousness that's not our own. Our liturgy celebrates the judgment that is passed on the prince of this world. The judgment that is passed in favor of the crucified Messiah. And if you're paying attention, this liturgy not only alerts you to your need, it also alerts you to the grace that supplies your need in the one who is crucified and risen for us. And our liturgy supplies us with a way to repent and believe uh, in, in accord uh, with that teaching. At the center of the Spirit's witness is not about, you might say, what rules we have broken. At the center of the Spirit's witness is Christ, the person of Christ, the work of Christ, and what God is doing and has done and will do in him. When the Spirit of truth is come, Jesus says, he will guide you into all truth. And then he explains what he means by that. He says, he shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine, therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. Everything that God has revealed, the truth he's revealed, he's revealed by his Son, and that revelation of the truth in his Son, who is the Word of God, is what the Spirit is going to communicate to us, make us capable of receiving. And everything that the Father has accomplished in his Son for our redemption, that, uh, the doing of his goodwill for our salvation, the Spirit in turn is going to impart and communicate and transmit to us who repent and believe in him. The Spirit is not about inventing new truths or inventing new gospels, right? So in the Roman Catholic tradition, you've got a strong view that the Spirit's work actually is precisely to do that, to add additional truths to the truths that were known to the apostles and written in the New Testament. And the liberal church does the same thing. It says, well, the Bible says this, but the Spirit is leading us into new truth. That's not what Jesus says. Jesus says that everything the Father, uh, all the truth the Father has revealed and uh, has given to me is uh, to be revealed to the world is al already given and is now to be revealed by the Spirit. And so the work of the Spirit is not to bring, invent new, uh, new truths or new religions or new gospels, but to open our eyes more fully to the wonder, uh, the majesty, the beauty, and the greatness of what God has already accomplished 
for us in Christ. That's what it means when it says, he shall glorify me. He's going to exhibit, reveal in its fullness the greatness of the glory of Christ as Savior and Lord. So, you know, in one sense, this uh, gospel lesson speaks about the Spirit's ministry to the unbelieving world and how the unbelieving world can be brought to repentance and faith and no longer be the unbelieving world but be disciples. But this gospel lesson also speaks about what the Spirit does for the disciples because if you've already received the Word of God and been reborn of God, St. James tells us in the epistle lesson, you still have, a, and there's still an imperative for you to receive with meekness the engrafted Word which is able to save your souls. And the point here is that we're being guided into all truth. We're being led more fully, deeply, clearly into the fullness of the truth that has been revealed by God in his Son. And it is as we come to share more fully and deeply in that truth, as we come to share consciously and willingly in the truth of God's goodwill towards men, if, as we do what our collect today talks about, loving what God commands and desiring what God promises, as we consciously and willingly embrace his will for us, so his will comes to fruition and fulfillment in us. We are made, as St. James says, a kind of first fruits of the creation, which is to say, in us, God's good purposes for the whole creation are coming, are finding, uh, or coming to fulfillment in us, in and through us, the whole creation is finding its destiny, which is another, nothing else than worshiping, knowing, and loving God, glorifying God and enjoying his infinite goodness forever. That's why it is indeed most expedient for us that Christ goes away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you, and in the coming of the Comforter is the work of Christ accomplished for us, now to be accomplished in us, for which we give most hearty thanks. Amen.
almighty and ever-living God, who by thy holy apostle has taught us to make prayers and supplications, and to give thanks for all men, we humbly beseech thee most mercifully to accept our alms and oblations, and to receive these our prayers which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord, and grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. We beseech thee also so to direct and dispose the hearts of all Christian rulers, that they may truly and impartially administer justice to the punishment of wickedness and vice and to the maintenance of thy true religion and virtue. Give grace, O Heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers, that they may both, by their life and doctrine, set forth thy true and lively word, and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. And to all thy people, give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. And we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor all those who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. And we also bless thy holy name for all thy servants departed this life in thy faith and fear. Beseeching thee to grant them continual growth in thy love and service, and to give us grace so to follow their good examples, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Grant this, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear what comfortable words our Savior Christ saith unto all who truly turn to him. Come unto me, all ye that travail and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. So God loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, to the end that all that believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Hear also what St. Paul saith. This is a true saying, and worthy of all men to be received, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Hear also what St. John saith. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. Mm -hmm. 
The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto our Lord God. It is 